costs of such uh, issues could be discrimination or, for instance, lower social cohesion in communities that are more diverse. So, chapter one was motivated by a finding in the literature that in more diverse communities, there are several things which go worse than in less diverse ones. So for instance, the quality of public goods in those communities is lower, different measures of social cohesion might be worse, and one outcome that I focused on in this chapter is people uh, turn out in elections less, so they vote less. I was interested if uh, instead of looking at the diversity of these communities at the time when they decide whether to vote or not, we would take a step back in time and examine their, the diversity that people in these communities <clears throat> sorry, uh, <clears throat> that people in these communities experience in their childhood or adolescence. <clears throat> And the idea behind this being that uh, should you be exposed to diversity early on, this might shape how you view diversity as an adult and thus indirectly influence these outcomes, potentially alleviating them. And with the help of someone who's here in the audience, I found out about a very nice data set that allowed me to study this problem um, because it's a very large uh, longitudinal survey from the United States which contains information about uh, people's school cohorts and the racial backgrounds of everyone in their school, as well as their voting behavior and political preferences seven years later when they are young adults. And in this chapter, I find that those uh, pupils who are more ex exposed to uh, slightly more diversity in their school cohort vote more according to a, an index of, of racial diversity, this index does not influence people's pr political preferences. However, if they are exposed to more <coughs> black individuals in their cohort, uh, this makes them identify Democrat more often. And I do not find any differences um, with respect to parental family income or own race. Now I will jump directly to chapter three, where I examine another problem that might arise when people with different identities interact with one another. And the scale is also very different because I'm looking at one-to-one -one interactions and I'm looking at them in an experimental fashion, so not using data collected by, by others. Um, I'm looking specifically about trusting relationships when the, the partner that you can decide whether to trust or not, is part of your own group or part of different groups. And the two sh uh, sizes of the onions on the screen here represent that often trust in members of your own group is higher than that in members of other groups. Now, with these different colors, I tried to show how I think we often uh, work in experimental economics. Namely, we use several treatments to try to isolate the contribution of different factors to the overall behavior that we're interested in studying. And in this case, this is about trusting. So one such factor could be um, how trustworthy you believe your interaction partner to be. Another one, it could be how much you care about this partner benefiting from your trust. In this chapter, I was studying um, another factor, which is called betrayal aversion. And betrayal aversion actually works against um, trusting because if you're more betrayal averse, you are less likely to trust someone uh, for fear that you might experience an emotional cost in case you are betrayed. So as I mentioned in this uh, chapter, I only focus on this specific factor. I measure it towards other uh, members of your own group versus members of other groups, and I try to see how much it contributes to the decisions to trust these people, also how uh, the contribution of this factor evolves over time. My participants are students at this university. The groups that I use are quite a so uh, an innocuous social identity, so not of the uh, seriousness that I gave as an example in the first chapter, so race. Here, they're just groups that have been randomly, uh, to which people have been randomly assigned in order to increase their social integration in the first year of studies. 
so yes, yeah, so I study them at the beginning of an academic year and also towards the end to see how the contribution of betrayal aversion towards in versus out group members changes between these two uh, times. Now, why would such a study be interesting in general? I will try to give you a sort of example from the real world. Let's assume that you have a housing market and you have two types of people in it, locals and immigrants, and all the landlords are locals, the um, potential tenants are either locals or immigrants. Now, if the local landlords trust the local tenants more and are more likely to offer them accommodation and sign rental contracts with them, you could end up with a systemic type of problem where immigrants find it very, very difficult to find an accommodation. Now, as a social planner, if you want to do something about that, what determinant of trust would work as a good lever in order to address this problem? So yes, I'm looking at one such potential lever. What I find in my study is that betrayal aversion doesn't seem like a good lever to, to focus on and other factors um, are more promising. I also find an issue with how betrayal aversion has been measured in previous studies. Okay, and now to chapter four. This one is a bit of a more methodological chapter, so I thought an analogy would, would work best. Let's, examine we ha uh, let's consider we have a family that has to make the decision whether they want to go for a picnic or stay at home. And if they go for this picnic, there's a 1% chance that they get bit by this venomous deadly spider, which really exists. It's, I, I looked it up, it's the most venomous spider in Australia. Um, so they have to answer this question. But the family that I'm considering, because uh, I ran an experiment, has to make this type of decision in one of two worlds that I'll call here the first world and the second world. And the family is the same, but the two worlds differ from one another. The way in which they differ is that in the first world, people have, let's call them first world problems. That means that if they have other pot potential spots where they could have a picnic, except for, for the one I'm asking them about, these have very low risks. So they might have the odd one mosquito or two drops of rain. So in comparison, the question I'm asking about, you know, do you want to go have a picnic where there's this deadly spider, even with a 1% chance of biting you? This in comparison looks very terrible, right? On the other hand, people in the second world are unfazed when they hear about the, the spider. Because anywhere they go outside, there are all these creepy creatures that might bite them. So of course, it just doesn't look so scary after all, right? Now, why do, am I interested in asking the exact same question in these two types of scenarios? Uh, it's because according to certain theories, the answer should be the same because the question is the same, the risks are the same, the family is the same. What I find in my experiment is that this is not the case. And um, as you probably intuitively expect, people in the first world are more likely to say no, no way, while people in the second world are more likely to accept this risk if all the other alternatives except for staying at home are um, even worse. So, to summarize, in my thesis, I find that racial diversity during adolescence can boost voting and thus alleviate problems of lower turnout in diverse communities. And something I didn't mention when I talked about chapter one, there's evidence that this could happen through increased interracial friendships even more than a decade later. Then I also find that when it comes to trust, and trusting members of other groups, it doesn't seem that tar targeting betrayal aversion and trying to reduce betrayal aversion has the potential to actually increase trust in members of other groups. Uh, something I didn't mention because it's in chapter two and that was in the interest of time, is that I also check whether betrayal aversion can become negative if there is no motive to betray, and I find that this is not the case. 
I also find a potential issue with how betrayal aversion was measured in previous literature. And this issue has to do with what I was studying in chapter four, namely the general safety or riskiness of the setting um, in, from which, um, in which this, this question is being answered. And I find that the safer the general setting, the lower the willingness to take risks. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And with this, I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Dr. Bart Goldstein, who was the chair of the assessment committee and who is a professor in human capital and social economics at this university. Thank you. Dear candidate, dear Maria, congratulations on finishing your thesis. I very much enjoyed reading it. I think it contains uh, chapters of very high quality and it's very well written. Your analysis are relevant, novel, very creative and insightful. Um, my question is on chapter one, um, and I think it's a very rich uh, chapter with uh, many thoughtful and careful analysis. I especially appreciated the thor thorough methodology, um, five methods, that's good, <laughs> to analyze the randomness of the treatment and the profound extensions of the, of the main analysis. Uh, I was also very glad to hear from Raymond that it has just been accepted for publication at the Economics of Education Review, which is a very respected uh, journal. But of course, here in light of this defense, um, I'm going to take a critical position. So, uh, so let's get started. And my, my question is on the interpretation of the size of the main result. Um, and uh, there are two tables for, uh, that I want to uh, look at, table 1.4 and table 1.2. So in table 1.4, on page uh, 32, you report the main result, and you find that an increase in this racial diversity index by one within school standard deviation increases the voting probability by 1.1 percentage points. And that represents an increase of 2.6% relative to the unconditional probability of voting. Uh, so so the within school standard deviation increase um, leads, to, leads to this effect. Um, but, and, then, and then you say on page 33 that these effects are sizable. And I think that's actually an understatement of the, of the size of the effect. And that is because on page uh, 25, on table 1.2, you, you're saying that uh, you're showing that a one within school standard deviation is very small. Uh, so uh, it's only uh, roughly one-tenth of a standard deviation across schools. So if I extrapolate your within-school result of 2.6% to the between-school variation, then that would mean that a one standard deviation change in racial diversity between schools would increase voting probability to about 26%. So... That, that's what, what got me, uh, yeah, that's, that's what, what I was wondering about. So this, isn't this effect very large? Um, what do you think about this? Uh, is it possible? Can we extrapolate these within school findings to the between school variation? I'm curious to hear your result, your, your answer. <laughs> Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and for the interesting question. So you ask about extrapolating from the size of the effect that I find uh, within, uh, from the within school variation to between school variation. Um, and I believe this would be a bit of a stretch mm -hmm. because there is quite some variation in the types of schools and the types of cohorts that uh, are part of my sample. So I'm not sure that this uh, between school variation would be a meaningful, like, I'm not sure what it would tell us about any of the schools that we actually have in the sample. And because of that reason, I would not go in that direction uh, and claim such large effects. Um, yeah. So yes, I think, because again, there is variability in the types of schools in my sample and the cohort sizes, um, this is not 
a correct way to, to interpret the results. So I would stay with the within uh, variation result that I report. Okay, thank you very much. So we move on to the second question. Oh yeah, okay. Um, okay, then I have a second question about chapters two and three. And it's also about the size of the results. So, uh, <laughs> um, and in, uh, so I noticed that in both chapters, you, you don't talk at all about the size of the results, which I found a bit strange. Um, you only discuss whether the relationships are statistically significant. Um, and uh, I, I think that's a bit unfortunate, both when the results are significant, but, also, but especially also when you report the null results. Uh, so in chapter two, for instance, you find weak evidence of SRP and no evidence of strategic risk discount in the aligned interest game. So my question is whether this null result could be due to the small sample size. Uh, you only have a, ch a sample of 222 participants. Uh, so one way to think about my question is to think about the economic importance of the, of the coefficient if it had been significant. Mm. And you only, yeah, so, so that's, that's my second question then. If, uh, if you could, if you could uh, take a look at these coefficients and tell us how big the main effects would be if they would have been significant. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your second question. Uh, I would like to ask you to indicate a, a table that I could have a look at for this. Uh... Um, yeah, for instance, on, yeah, it's on page 92, but I have to see on which, and, uh, latest version of the PhD, yep. which I think It might have been uh, swapped with one Yeah, I think it's page 90, 89. Um. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, I think it's 89, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So in '89, for instance, you see that there are uh, yeah many insignificant results, mm -hmm. but uh, that's because of the 222. So that's on uh, table 2.3. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But uh, my question is, what uh, are these are these results economically meaningful? If you if they would have been significant. Yes, now I have to remember because um, the first line of coefficients refers to betrayal aversion. I think it was towards in-group members or actually, no, uh, just uh, because here there are many linear combinations in this table, so I have to remember which one was uh, what. So. For instance, yes, uh, let me just quickly have a look at the, uh, at the hypothesis because I think that uh, makes it clear which one, which uh, coefficient represents. But yes, because you're commenting on hypotheses one and two, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, given that, I'm looking in table 2.3, and the sizes of the coefficients for hypothesis one, so for basically betrayal aversion, um, are reported in the first line, and for uh, the hy hypothesis two, which is about having a strategic risk discount in the aligned interest game, would be lower among the linear combinations reported there. Um, and yes, your question was about whether the sample size makes it not significant, and I believe that this could easily be the case. Um, yes, so in this study, let's say that the plan was different than what we actually managed to, to get in terms of data because we had a much bigger sample size of people that we... Um, that participated in our study. However, there was a, a particular reason why I was interested in this pool and not another one. And then I had to sort of live with the conditions that, uh, you know, 
were available. And that meant that I had uh, only 20 minutes in which they could do this experiment. They were also in the first month of their studies, which means that many of them failed the comprehension test. And I think the size of the sample that you see there is, I don't know, something like a third of, of the total uh, sample of subjects that we, we had in there. So the plan would have been to have a larger sample size. And um, had that been the case, and let's say that the coefficient that we see there for hypothesis two would have been significant, then I would argue that, so that would have supported um, hypothesis two, and it would have been, um, yes, the strategic risk premium would have been reversed, but by, um, but it represents, I think, I don't, I wouldn't know which, let's say col column four, it would have been maybe an eighth of the size of the premium that we see for betrayal aversion. Yes, and how would I further interpret that? Then I think that it would, it could still be beneficial to try to, to target this um, absence, like a motive to, motives to betray, uh, but the effects are also not huge, so there is a limit to what you can do, even though it works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Arno Riedel, who was also a member of the assessment uh, committee and who is a professor in public economics at this university. The floor goes to Professor Riedel. Thank you. Uh, dear candidate, uh, dear Maria, uh, I yeah, also would like to congratulate you with this very nice uh, piece of work. I think it's a very nice, well-written and thoroughly uh, executed uh, thesis and, uh, and PhD. So congratulations. And uh, you're also now in the beautiful city of Vienna. <laughs> uh, where you have already a, a postdoctoral position, I think it's uh, well deserved uh, given uh, the PhD uh, you've read, the thesis you've written. Uh, so, still, I'm here to ask a question. I would like to ask a question about Chapter Three, uh, and not so much about the results, but I have some questions about uh, how you set it up and the experimental design. Uh, just to give it a little bit of uh, of a frame. So what you would, what you set out there in this chapter is uh, to look at uh, betrayal aversion as a mechani potential mechanism of trust and non-trusting, and how this uh, differs between in-group and out-group members. So whether betrayal aversion is smaller within in-group members or people you know, uh, you have uh, uh, short social distance versus uh, people you do not know that uh, that uh, that well. Uh, and for that, what you do is to, uh, you have uh, this uh, two trust games uh, and, uh, and you have two treatments, right? So, and the treatments are actually called T1 and T2. And T, I think, stands for time uh, or treatment. So it could be both. Anyway, so uh, T1 is at the very beginning when groups are formed and uh, you very can assume, okay, so there's no difference basically between an in-group and out-group members, so that's the idea. Uh, and then you have uh, this uh, treatment T2, which is, I think, I'm not sure, but I think seven months later. Uh, and now, of course, it's crucial how you form the in-group uh, and, and the out-group. And what you do is, so, in the in-group is uh, so that uh, this, uh, these are students uh, and they are put here uh, randomly into study group or in tu tutorial groups, I guess. Uh, or is no, it, they had also some social activities. Okay, okay but mm -hmm. it's some, so, some kind of learning, learning groups, right? Uh, and then you write, and it's on page 123, you don't have to look it up, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not so important, just uh, to give this a frame. The students interact more with members of their own group throughout uh, the first year of study. In all the classes they take, the classmates are from the same group, and they participate in social activities with members of the group only, and so on, and so on. Uh, while they do interact with the rest of the cohort, and that's crucial, right? And then you write, I assume that the social groups matter enough to create a feeling of in-group, out-group as time passes between T1 and T2. So I come to my question soon. But uh, so there is, uh, because lots of it hinges on this, I assume. 
So for instance, on page 128, uh, this is just an example where you uh, formulate hypothesis four, five, and six. Uh, you refer to a paper by, I think it's Bagini or Bassin, I don't know, and Eckel from 2018. Very right, because of this, I believe it is more plausible that the weaker identity, like the one used in the study, needs a longer time to produce effects, full stop. And then I thus assume the effects found by Pagin and Eckel are more likely at T2. Uh, and then there are the results, and then you basically find no effects. So I'm wondering, uh, so maybe I've overlooked this, but I didn't see any measure of in-group, out-group uh, connect connections, uh, closeness uh, uh, between, uh, uh, yeah, comparing, for instance, T1 and T2. So, uh, so I'm wondering, first of all, why you did uh, not do this? Uh, maybe I've overlooked it, then please correct me. Uh, and if you did not do this, so, and you have to make these assumptions uh, that uh, people make this link, but I mean, there could be, because they're also interact, you also write it, right? They are also interacting with other groups in the cohort. And maybe, you know, learning in these groups is not so fun. Uh, maybe they have fights. Uh, maybe they start to hate each other. Uh, uh, and maybe, you know, there's lots of heterogeneity. I mean, in some groups, they love each other, and in other groups, they hate each other or some in some subgroups uh, are closely linked and others not. So, so my question, my first question, as I said already, is, you know, why did you not measure it? Uh, and the second is, in light of, you know, uh, my comments, uh, how would you, what would be your interpretation of your null results, right? And uh, would you find, uh, so, so given that, you, let's say, you cannot read your experiment, do you see any way of getting, for instance, at some heterogeneous effects on that, that you see that you kind of find out ex post that perhaps, you know, within some subgroups there might be uh, uh, outgroup effects uh, and in others not? So, looking forward to your answer. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the kind words and for the very relevant questions. Um, you asked about why I have not tried to actually test my assumption of whether this in-group, out-group was created and there was a sensible way to in see this, this group formation as leading to, to the results I hypothesize. Um, so I think, yes, this is indeed what uh, I wanted to include in there. Now, these groups were created by the administration office, and it was kind of a pilot project that they were doing that year. So they assigned people to these groups at the beginning of the year. They had, uh, so in completely independently of what I do in this study, they had, after the first uh, study period, the first block, they asked people some questions in these uh, evaluations that they have to fill in. They added questions specifically about groups, and I report some of those results in, in one of the appendices. My expectation was that because they were piloting this, they would also, and that was their plan actually, follow up at the end of the year with a similar uh, battery of questions. And unfortunately, something happened there along the way. I don't know what exactly, but they sort of gave up the whole project and then they never came back to these people with that type of questions. Uh, also at that time I had left Maastricht, so I remember trying and emailing and trying to find out if this type of data is available anywhere. And yes, unfortunately it isn't. So yes, I had made the wrong assumption that that type of data that would allow me to check for this would be available, it wasn't. And the best way that I could try to do something about this was by adding that uh, question at the end in the survey after the experiment about whether, uh, like a hypothetical allocation question in which uh, they could allocate a given ticket, lottery ticket, because this is how they were paid in lottery tickets, to a member of their own group or to anyone else. And I tried to use that to, to test whether there's a change. Um, I, as far as I remember, it's also a bit difficult to tell if this is the case uh, in 
in these groups. And the reasons that you mentioned, namely that students interact not only with people in these social groups, but also with other members of their cohort. So uh, maybe it, it's important actually to mention that the, the groups themselves are the ones in which they take all courses. So it's, there are 60, about roughly 60 members uh, in one of these groups. And then whichever tutorial group they're assigned to throughout the first year, it always contains people from these groups. So in terms of class, they only interact with these people. Uh, yes, and I agree. So I thought the identity is probably weaker than, for instance, living in a dorm uh, together. What has been at least what had happened at least in the beginning of the year was that there was some money and there were weekly social gatherings organized for for these groups. I'm not sure for how long they survived because I think part of the reason why the project was dropped was that things were not going well. And uh, yes, so it seemed like something that, you know, when you see randomness, I think as a, <laughs> as a researcher, your eyes start to sparkle and that's exactly what happened. And I thought, oh, this is a nice opportunity. But in the end, it didn't work out as planned. And I think during your PhD, it's, it's difficult to find such, such occasions. So yes, I jumped on it. Thank you. Let's take to this. Uh, the opposition uh, will be continued by Professor Dr. Kirsten Rode, who was also a member of the assessment committee and who is a professor in behavioral economics at Erasmus University Rotterdam. The floor goes to Professor Rode. Thank you. Um, dear candidate, I would like to join the others in, in congratulating you with a very, very nice thesis. What I find especially noteworthy is that you've shown to be able to work with secondary data as well as to run uh, experiments. I think that's, that's, uh, that's impressive. Um, my question is about chapter two. And in chapter two, I'm actually still a bit puzzled why the game that you consider there is called the trust game. So let me explain why I'm, why I'm puzzled there. So, so in these games, the action of the first mover depends on the actions of the second mover, in the sense that you say, OK, I, I quote you now, first movers in the trust game and in the aligned interest game indicated the minimum percentage of second movers in their treatment who would have to choose left for them to prefer in over out. So, so these first movers condition their actions on, on what they believe the second movers will do. And then I'm thinking, doesn't this then effectively make the first mover a second mover? And, and, and the second mover a first mover, maybe? So, so what, is, what does the literature, literature say on the comparison between the game that you consider as you implement it and the usual trust game where you don't, co as first mover, you don't condition your, uh, your action on what the second mover will do. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and for the interesting question. Uh, you're asking about uh, like a conditional type of answer from uh, the first player in a trust game versus uh, standard binary or not trust game and whether so on the one hand, what the differences are in, types of, in terms of behavior, but also whether then this means anything about trusting. <laughs> um, yes, and the literature finds that it is quite different and there are papers, um, so most of the papers that work, uh, that try to identify betrayal aversion use the exact setting that I have used. So ask for this conditional, uh, probability. Um, and you are right, because I remember a paper by Lee, I think, Wacker and Turmunk that, uh, from Games and Economic Behavior in 2020, which actually helped me argue with one of my, super, or not argue, support the argument that we need to run uh, the experiment in chapter four, <laughs> uh, because they say precisely that the, t the way that players perceive this game has this additional first stage in which the probability is determined, uh, the probability of trustworthiness, or in the case of the control game, of the good outcome, which would make the second mover, sorry, the first mover a second mover. Um, 
and because of that, uh, that this differs quite uh, a lot from from the uh, from the game where you're simply asked whether you want to trust or not. And is, is typically, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, is, is, is typically also the, the are the fine, are, is the behavior of these first movers different uh, in the two types of games or, or, or is that not, not possible to say because the games are really different and the type of behavior yeah, I'm, is I'm different? I'm not trying to remember if there are papers that compare this and I don't think I've seen, so I would have to remember findings from different yeah. papers to answer okay. this. I mean, I, I remember papers which either make explicit the a distribution of, uh, so for instance, uh, I think a paper by Fetchenhauer and Dunning tells people exactly what the probabilities of the good and the bad outcome are, and then they only ask, do you want to trust or not, period. So not, would you trust for this probability? Um, and they find actually the reverse of, of betrayal aversion. So yes, it does seem to matter a lot whether you no, at least, so th th it's actually a slightly different comparison than the one you're asking about, um, because it's about known probabilities versus mm -hmm. some that you sort of create mm -hmm. in, in your own mind. But for instance, uh, yes, I'm now trying to recall a study by uh, one of the opponents here, <laughs> which uses trust games, but I think it's about second movers in trust games who have different identities, so I don't think that would help to answer the question. No, so sorry, I cannot recall this uh, comparison uh, to tell you, but I'm sure it matters because at least when people are given the probabilities where, uh, versus when they're not, uh, the results are different. And, and can we still call it a trust game, let's uh, say? Is it still a matter of trust or? That is a good question because basically the first mover sets up the entire setting and then is there any room for any trust to happen in there? It's true that I didn't, I sort of took it for granted, but maybe that's not trust in the end. It's, uh... On the other hand, it is also maybe similar to contracts, some contracts that you sign, and in a sense, because the second mover can... So you set up this probability that you are willing to accept. However, you might still face a second mover that uh, betrays you. So in that sense, there is still room, but Yes, would I call that trust? It, maybe it's a bit of an artificial uh, concept. And I know I found it very difficult to explain this game to, to lay people in the audience. <laughs> so, yes. And I agree, like, if, if it were not for this conditional probability, it would be a lot easier for, for them to understand why I call it that way. Yeah, thank, yeah. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Elena Setulin. Um, who, was in, who was also a member of the assessment committee and uh, who is an associate professor in behavioral economics and experimental economics. The floor goes to her. Thank you. Uh, dear Maria, dear candidate, well, I will also uh, join the others in congratulating you on this very nice uh, piece of work. I think you have posed very interesting questions and the thesis is very well written. Um, so my question is about chapter one. And well, first of all, I should congratulate you again because I just learned during the defense that uh, you actually published uh, this paper, so it's a, it's a great achievement. Um, so my question is about your uh, choice to uh, measure racial diversity at the cohort level. I think this is a very important choice that you make and it's also key in your identification assumption. And I would like you to uh, justify your uh, choice a little bit more what I have in mind is that cohorts are very large and it's actually difficult to imagine that they matter for social interaction, which is one of the channels that you actually want to put forward. Um, I would have expected that what matters most are classes because they are fixed and they are smaller. So I would like to elaborate a little bit on that. And... Um, also, I would like to know if you know how classes were formed, so if you can also assume that random assignments along uh, racial measures uh, happens at the class level, or if there are any concerns that actually classes are formed on the base of race, and what you're picking up at the cohort level is maybe a confound effect. Thank you. Esteemed opponent, thank you for your nice words and for the interesting question. Uh, the first question was about the level at which I chose to focus on, on 
racial diversity. And the reason is precisely one that you sort of hint in your second question, namely that um, at cohort level, there is less room for people to select in and out of a certain class. And from my understanding of how classes were formed was that in different subjects, people would have, or might have maybe like the, in the electives or so, they could have different classmates, but there could be some sort of sorting um, also by the school into classes. So uh, one indicator was uh, a variable present in, um, I think a survey that the principals had to answer about whether they grouped classes by ability in English, because you could have people whose first language is not English, for instance, and this could correlate uh, with racial background. So I try to, I control for that. Um, but yes, the answer to the first question would be that the cohort level was, there was less room for this selection to, to happen, and that's why I, I focused on it. Um, I actually forgot to write down your second question. <laughs> May you, I ask you to re um, repeat it? Well, I think there was not a proper second question, but I was indeed asking you to elaborate a little bit on uh, whether you know if classes are, are actually random or if there is selection happening at the class level. So I think you already addressed that. And um, yes, um, so, but let me just briefly go back to the first question. Um, so. Are you confident to argue uh, that interaction at the cohort level among students that are in the same cohort level can happen? Do you have anecdotal evidence to say that this is a relevant um, place for interaction to take place? Because, yeah, this is one of the mechanisms that you argue is important. So thank you for your second question. I think I have an analysis somewhere in the appendix. I would have to look, up, uh, look it up. Uh, but so one of the checks was to see whether racial diversity creates more interracial friendships also uh, during the school years. And uh, this is highly significant and positive. And one of the analyses I, in the appendix, which I can look up, but I don't remember where it is, I check how many of the friendship nominations are actually for people who are in your cohort versus in your school or outside of the cohort, because they also had sister schools, for instance, from which they could nominate. People. And I think it was like 70 or 80 percent of the people that they nominate as friends are part of their own cohort, which I think is a fairly high number and then allows me to, to assume that that's what matters. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Holof van der Velde, <coughs> who is a professor in education and occupational careers at this university. The floor goes yep. to Professor van der Velde. Thank you. Um, Dear Maria, dear candidate, um, this was a very nice thesis, really. Uh, I enjoyed reading it. Uh, it's a relevant topic. I think, um, you know, in all about the social identity, so I, I, I really love that. I also love the, um, um, the front page. Uh, I'm, a fr I'm, I'm a big fan of Edward Hopper. Uh, and I will come back to Hopper uh, in a minute. Uh, I have a question on chapter one, just uh, like the others. And like uh, Bart already mentioned, and which was also a, a, a little bit implicated in the, in the, in the previous question, um, you find very large effects of racial diversity uh, in, uh, 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 on, on later voting behavior. These effects are as large as um, Intensive door-to-door -door canvassing, you know, more or less the same effect. Um, huge, and in a way, it's it's uh, hopeful. I would say uh, it's, uh, many people would would say it, this is a it, this is a very relevant outcome. Um, and but still, you know, uh, in my view. It, it, it's probably a little bit too good to be true. And, and, and if things are a little bit too good to be true, then maybe they are a little bit too good to be true, right? So um, I, I was looking for, um, for things like, okay, maybe you, you misspecified, et cetera. But what you do in the chapter is you run 
a, a large series of robustness checks, very eloquent, very convincing. I thought, okay, there's nothing in, in your specification, at, at, at least it not, not what I can find. And still it is, um, it is very large. And, um, and what intrigues me even more is that um, the, the data set itself would actually, I would, if you would have, would have asked me whether you would find large results, I would have said, well, probably no, because of two reasons. One is your diversity index is colorblind. So moving from an all white school to a mixed school, or moving from an all black school to a mixed school has the same effect, right? Is at least, uh, I, you, you can't differentiate between the two. And um, I could imagine that it might have uh, opposite effects. So then using this measure, which is colorblind, would actually cancel out uh, opposite of uh, the, uh, the, the effect. So, um, and then, when I looked at the at, at, at sample, you only use the an, a large sample um, uh, to to create your your racial diversity index. If I understand it correctly, then on average you have some 25 students per grade. There were 17 plus 17 in the original sample. You have an enhanced sample with uh, based on 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 race. Um, but you don't have all the people, so 25. And for these 25, they are uh, representative for the whole grade, all classes, all ability groups. On the basis of sampling error alone, I would expect that, you know, the one would be a bit too high, the other would be a bit too low, at least. And this is measurement error, right? Mm -hmm. With measurement error, you, you would not find an effect. And still, you find these huge effects. Um, so my, I, I was trying to find a, 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 a gap, <laughs> something which, which was missing. And I think I found one. And, and that is, um, as you indicate in the paper, you also have ability grouping, right? You have ability grouping in the schools. But you don't, you control for this at the school level, but not at the individual level, if I understand correctly. But then maybe what you find is some effect of that, you know, in, in, in one grade in the school, you measure the low ability group, <laughs> or in the, and in the other grade, the, uh, the high ability group, and so, I'm not sure that this would that this would really um, uh, 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 explain your results, but at least might hint to something else. So I was wondering whether you have any thoughts about that. And by, by the way, yeah, I, I, I promised to get back to Hopper <laughs> um, because what I like about Hopper is you know you see this picture, and this is an artist's view, right? Normally, in the paintings of uh, uh, houses, do not look, look like that. Cafes do not look, pubs do not look like what, what is painted by Hopper, uh, by, by Hopper. And um, and so maybe what you have here is not the artist's view, but the researcher's view, limited point of view of of the social reality. So, thanks. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the very nice story <laughs> and also for your interesting question. Um, so you asked about the effect sizes again. Uh, I, I must say that they're not as big as the ones for from door-to-door -door canvassing. I think they're like 30% or something. Yeah, okay. but, but yes. uh, more or less in the, same, yes. in the same range, right? Yes, I have to admit that. Um, so... You were suggesting that maybe I pick up something else that could be explained by uh, having different people being followed over time uh, in these cohorts. So uh, to clarify again, in this is a longitudinal study and the first wave is like a census of schools. So it includes everyone in the selected schools such that it is representative of the um, school age population between 12 and 18 in the United States 
at that point. And then it's true that a fraction of these people are followed over time. So when I ask, uh, when the questions about voting and political preferences are asked in a subsequent wave, it's only this subset that we have information for. But again, yes. Yeah, but, but I thought that the race was only asked for this, say, enhanced sample within a grade. So more or less, so that's at, at least what I, that this is what I read in your, in your chapter. So maybe I'm wrong, but, uh, but I thought there was uh, a, a basic sample of 17 males, 70 females in each grade, plus an enhanced sample, plus, so plus a, a, an oversampling by race and twins and uh, other things. And so, but not everybody, that you do not have the race for everybody in the cohort. I do. You do? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um. <laughs> I do. So the, uh, my independent variable is created by having information about everyone in the, in the school. Because they're first asked like a census type of question where they cover everyone with a basic uh, short survey. And then from those people, a subset are followed over time. Sorry, in that case, I, I, <laughs> I, I think you really have a, a very intriguing story here. <laughs> and uh, it's good that it's published, uh, so, so well-deserved. Um, and um, I'm still a little bit, you know, <laughs> puzzled about, okay, <laughs> uh, this is a random allocation to a cohort, you're right, so you you could have entered the school in, you know, the year before or the year after. But, um, you know, if these things happen, okay. So I, I remember to answer that briefly, that I have looked at some point at whether you're like a first time student or not. I don't remember that playing a role. Maybe one thing I could look at is whether the people who are followed over time are special in any way in terms of ability level, because I didn't look at heterogeneity in terms of ability level, or sorry, not ability level, uh, being sorted by ability into classes maybe, or yes, because uh, in terms of their own ability, I have their GPA and I control for that. Okay, thank you. The opposition will be continued by an absent uh, member, that's uh, Dr. Vibral, uh, who regretfully uh, couldn't take part here, but he sent in um, a question which uh, Professor Goldstein is so kind to um, read to you, and then you can respond to this. Um, yeah, he sent uh, two questions, a general and a technical question, but I will read the general question. Or do you prefer the technical? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. Uh, dear Maria, congratulations from my side on this fine thesis. It reflects a strong desire not to betray science. And I think you have succeeded by being open, thor thorough, and careful. Reading the thesis brought me back to the beginning of my academic career when the Betrayal Aversion paper had just come out. Ever since then, I've been wondering what other disciplines have to say about the concept and whether our well-defined notion and lab measure of Betrayal Aversion might not be too narrow or ignoring many potential interesting aspects of this phenomenon. Could you reflect a bit on this? He also says, good luck with the defense. And that's nice. <laughs> so addressing Matthias, esteemed opponent, <laughs> thank you <laughs> for your kind words and the interesting question. So knowing Matthias's background, I'm thinking he might hint towards some neuro type of studies that could uh, try to look at what happens in people's brains, for instance, when they're uh, facing this type of situation. Um, but to be honest, I am not very familiar with that literature. Um, I still think it would be very interesting to, to see what it has to say about feeling betrayed versus, yes, I, because the, the role that I'm interested in in this, these papers is the one that might experience betrayal. Um, yeah, so I think, I think he's, he's pointing out, uh, he's asking about what other disciplines, so like sociology and so on, have to say about, about this concept and whether the, uh, the measure in the, in the lab is not too narrow uh, relative to the concept in, say, sociology. Yes. So I think that is a fair point. Uh, I remember a discussion between my supervisors who have different 
specializations. Um, and that's when it became clear to me that this is a difference uh, between experimental economists and people who work with secondary data mainly, namely that experimental economists might run to treatments, find an effect, and then put a label on it. Now, does that label really reflect the inherent motive that it claims to, to cover? Um, while in different types of, uh, like the, the type of work that uh, my other two supervisors do, they, they really thought when they heard betrayal aversion that that is a clear thing and afterwards uh, one tries to measure it. So yes, it might be too narrow. The time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. Uh, the Greek Committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defence. And I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose bad branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Get the Yeah.
can't fly by now, don't waste all your time Cause I'll go, I'll go, I'll go the extra mile
wasn't sure at the beginning. What happened? What? Yeah, I what? wasn't sure. So you were traveling. Yeah, yeah, no, he, he said uh, you, you can now sit, but of course it was directed at everyone else. We, but we both we both sit, sit and I was looking at him like, should we get up? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how this works. Yeah. He just sounded very authoritative when he said this. Yeah, this is backwards, right? Yeah. <laughs> Did you keep it that way? No, no I had it right on the wrong. It checked because I, I remember one defense, one defense we had upside down. You know what I realized actually this, because I was a bit annoyed that the thrower. Oh. Maria Eugenia Polipchuk, hopefully I pronounced your name correctly, at least I tried. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense, and in view of its positive verdict, and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Kervas is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom, and I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Hello. Um, before handing over uh, the diploma, I have to ask you something, something important. Um, do you promise um, to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times? to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible. I do. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Marie, Maria Eugenia Polipschuk, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attend, attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree of uh, the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear Dr. Maria Eugenia, um, I feel honored to be the first to congratu congratulate you on your PhD uh, degree. You certainly deserved it. It was a long road that began somewhat unfortunate in 2014 in more ways than one. Let me mention two. First, you were supposed to join the uh, NIMED Institute for your dissertation. Uh, in the area of the demographic transition and aging in relation to the labor market. During the first meeting of the NAMED team in 2014, you sprained your foot um, as you were about to board the train to Heerlen with us. Therefore, you couldn't go um, with us. You have been suffering from foot pain for a while. Uh, but the tone was set. You would never be part of the NAMED team. <laughs> Then it, turned, uh, then it also turned out that the data set we had on retirement was not suitable to write a paper with. It was a bit of a crisis for a while, yet you came up with a research proposal uh, with an American data set unknown to us and eventually managed to write a nice paper with it. Now, chapter one of your dissertation. The research topic was actually something different from our um, intention, but the great and long efforts of you 
with a good deal of support, of course, also from uh, your co-supervisor, uh, co Raymond uh, Montesan. We were uh, rewarded last week when the article was um, accepted for the Economics of Education Review, one of the best journals in the field of education. Then, with your research interest, you deviated even more from what Raymond and I envisioned when we appointed you. But your enthusiasm and conviction were hard to turn around, and I'm personally convinced that you should not kill the passion of a PhD. We gave it a try, but we needed someone to mentor you in the field of experimental economics. Fortunately, we found an excellent co-supervisor in the person of Martin Strobel. Um, we will conclude this uh, Laudate show in a moment. All in all, we, Raymond and I, are certainly proud of you for successfully completing the dissertation with a sympathetic general research question of how to improve cooperation and social cohesion in the light of diversity. Also on behalf of Raymond and the ROA staff, warm congratulations to you, your parents, family and husband. And I will now hand over the mic to Martin. Dear Maria, yeah, since I was um, talking to you quite often, particularly in the last part of your thesis, right, um, I asked Frank to also say some words uh, in a laudatio. So first I want to start with a question. Does the number 6005466 tell you something? Probably one of your phone numbers. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's, it's actually your student number because you belong to the first cohort of students in Maastricht who actually got a seven-digit number. And um, and I, I looked it up, so most likely we saw each other for the first time February the 1st in 2010. This was when my course on incentives and behavior started in your master, which you did back then in Maastricht. And it, after that, I still remember quite vividly how I was sitting uh, down with Matt Embry, right, after your defense of your master thesis, and we were discussing whether it would be feasible to get someone with a one-year master into a PhD program. And uh, we both said, oh, maybe. Um, but at that time, it was actually quite difficult, right? Uh, because we had this restriction that if you want to have a PhD position, at least in our department, then it would be a two-year master would be required. So actually then, we lost a bit contact, right, because you first uh, became a full-time teacher, then you went to Liège and to Brussels, or the other way around. And um, at some point, I heard that uh, Frank had a brilliant idea, namely to hire you on a PhD project. And um, since you also wanted to work a little bit experimentally, um, we, I mean, I was joining the team, the supervisory team, Actually, I do not regret it. I'm very happy about this uh, happening. Now, knowing you for such a long time, you would mean that I know you very well. But actually, when I was sitting down and trying to think a bit about uh, your characteristics, I, I didn't come up with some clear pattern. But let me, let me give it a, a try. And then I see whether I hit the nail or not. Um, so consider if you decide or distinguish two different types of people in the world, uh, the engineers and the artists. Now, engineering not in terms of their profession or their field, but in their way of thinking. Right? So engineers actually, they make a plan, they follow it step by step, they do one step after the other, they take two parts and then they put them together, then they take the next part, put them on top of that, if it doesn't really fit, they would just squeeze a bit and then, uh, and then they would make it fit. The Germans even have a word for this, technical word, which is called Presspassung. And, um, and they, would, they would also do it step by step and at the end they would have some working project. Right? Now there's the other type, which is the artist, who would let's say, gift is a much more holistic approach. We try to make it fit on every corner, and if things do not fit very well, he would just dismantle the whole thing again, and he would then try to a new approach to put them together in a different way. 
Now, scientists are much more artists than they are engineers, right? But I think you and me ex actually as well are even more on the artist side than uh, the average scientist is. And that's why actually it takes us so long to do things, right? Because we have to dismantle them a lot and then put them together again. But if we succeed, and that also I saw clearly now with your thesis, then they create some beautiful things, right? And uh, I mean, not, um, not only the cover, right? It, it is just a, a piece of art which you created. And I want to thank you for this. And uh, well, welcome to the artist side of science. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Dear Dr. Polipchuk, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I congratulate you, your family, your friends, your supervisors with the uh, degree you have acquired. And I would like to thank the members of the degree committee for their valuable contribution. Um, before closing uh, this session, um, we will, after closing, go to the main stairs and then take a picture uh, just to make sure that we uh, also, we have you well presented in our academic archives. Uh, thank you very much. Congratulations uh, once again. And with this, I close this session.